Thanks for joining us. I'm Steve Shu, And I'm Corey Washington, and we're your hosts for Manifold. This week, we're going to try something new. To make your listening experience efficient, we're going to provide a guide to when we discuss particular topics during the upcoming show. The first 30 minutes of this show is about U.S.-China relations and the development of science and technology in China over the past 30 years. The next 30 minutes are about the Hong Kong protests, and the last 15 or 20 minutes are dedicated to coronavirus. You'll find a detailed description of these topics along with timestamps in the show notes. Thanks for listening. Our guest today is Wang Yang. He is the Dean of Science at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Corey and I know him from his time at MSU, where he was the Chair of Mathematics. Prior to that, he was a professor at Georgia Tech, and he earned his PhD in 1990 at Harvard University under the supervision of Fields medalist David Mumford. Am I correct about that last point, Wong? Yes. 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 So I always thought of you as a little bit more on the applied math side, but then I realized your your thesis advisor is a fields medalist in algebraic geometry. So we, we never even yes. talked about that. Yeah, actually, uh, my my thesis was really on the uh, computer vision side. It's a very mathematical problem in computer vision called the, the Mumford Sharp problem. Uh, when I joined Harvard, uh, my advisor was beginning to switch from algebra geometry to computer vision. And uh, I was sort of caught the boat. You know, I, I, I was either the last pure math student he had or the first more or less the applied math student he had. Okay. And I was, my, my work was not related to algebra geometry, which was his field at the, you know, what he was known for. Uh, so it was more in computer vision, but it was very, very on the very theoretical side. It was actually a mathematical problem, not any application-oriented problem. Got it. The two fields are not totally disparate, actually, if you're thinking about. If you're going to try to figure out a kind of a area of pure math that intersects with computer vision, uh, yeah, you know, it'd be harder to get closer than, I mean, topology, et cetera, et cetera, but you're in the general ballpark. Okay, well, I don't, I don't want to get in too much into technical stuff right now, but let, let me talk a little bit about your biography. So you grew up in China, and your undergraduate degree is from University of Science and Technology in China, which is kind of a famous university there. And your career has really spanned a period of immense change in the level of development of China, the level of advancement in academic research. So... You want to reflect on that a little bit, like how you viewed the world in nineteen in the eighties when you first came to America, uh, versus now you're back in Asia, looking uh, across the Pacific at the United States. So maybe you can just riff on that a little bit. Uh, this was uh, actually very interesting. In fact, uh, you know, when I was in China at the time, my family was making about, I would say, maybe around fifty yuan a month. Uh, which was used at the at the exchange rate at the time was about um, maybe ten dollars, ten now, US dollars. Yeah, now it's like eight dollars uh, or uh, something. Official, no, that's the official rate was like five yuan for a dollar, but the black market rate was more like ten. Okay, so it's uh, more like five US dollars per month, and. Um, at the time, of course, we all dreamed of going out of the country. I mean, we, you know, we were looking forward. We, we were trying to find every opportunity we could find to uh, maybe go to the U.S. or Europe. It just happened I was selected as one of the um, students to go to the U.S. By the way, at that time, we did not have like a free uh, uh, choice system. Okay, you can't just say, you know, I want to go to the U.S. Let me apply for a visa. You know, no, no, no. That was not uh, the the way it was done. You have to be selected by uh, by the university. In fact, by the country, and they actually provided you the uh, uh, stipend. So most of my fellow uh, 
uh, maybe not most, but certainly many of them were on a national scholarship to go to the US. I actually was also on some kind of national scholarship, but uh, because my visa problem, uh, I needed to speed up the visa, it was already delayed. Actually, Harvard came through with a scholarship. It's called a U.S.-Japan Exchange Foundation <laughs> scholarship. And I had nothing to do with Japan, but I was only too happy to take it. So I actually got to the U.S. on this particular weird sounding, um, not weird sounding, but certainly a strange sounding scholarship for me, you know, because I was in no way at the time related to anything Japan. So you, you mentioned that everybody at that time wanted to get out of China and move to a more developed country. And where do you see that equilibrium now? So if you're, a, and obviously you're back in greater China now, if you're a talented, say, 20-something kid, uh, how strong is the pull to leave China and maybe work in Silicon Valley or London versus uh, staying there? Uh, today, how how does it how what's changed in that relationship? Well, you know, it's it's also very interesting. Uh, I read somewhere uh, a few months ago, I would say, that uh, right now the the overseas Chinese coming back to China, uh, the number has exceeded the number going out. Okay, so in the in the large picture, you see a brain gain in, in China. So uh, why is that? Okay. So I, I can talk my personal uh, feelings here. Actually, uh, if you're interested in innovation, let's say entrepreneurship, okay, uh, China, especially in the Bay Area, uh, I'm, we, are, we're, we call it the so-called Greater Bay Area, that's uh, the Guangdong province, uh, the several cities in Guangdong province, including Shenzhen, and uh, uh, Guangzhou and Hong Kong and Macau, okay? So uh, uh, this is a so-called Greater Bay Area. It's very, very exciting and there are a lot of opportunities for innovation. Let's say if you have some research result, you want to form your own company, uh, actually it's quite easy to get uh, some support and angel fund or even, you know, uh, significant government support to for you to form to develop your ideas and uh, you know uh, your company. Right. So the, this greater Bay Area, which I believe it's also called the Pearl River Delta region, yes. is that fair? It used to be called the Pearl River Delta. Now it's called the Greater Bay Area, and it comprises something like sixty million plus people. Uh, yes, and including Shenzhen, which many people regard as the Silicon Valley for hardware. Uh, in yeah. China, and um, also for pollutions now even you know you have Tencent, for instance, is, in, is based in Shenzhen. Yes, so it's a super dynamic region in China, and I think most Americans, you know, we're subject to relentless propaganda uh, against China. So basically, everybody here thinks it's a totalitarian police state, and they they can't imagine that some talented person with the opportunity of either being in the U.S. Silicon Valley or the various Silicon Valleys in China would choose to go back. It, it's, it's kind of a little mind-boggling for most Americans. So, do you agree with that, Corey? Or? I have to say I don't agree with that. I think, there's a, I think that's a certain line you get, especially in the popular press. But if you're at a university, you realize that quite a few Americans uh, have been going to China for quite a while and staying a very long time. And so if you just make the inference, you'd see there has to be something very attractive. And what's attractive is there's just a lot of money in China. I think Young, in fact, did not put a dollar amount on it, but he and I have had a conversations a few years ago, and I, I assume, as I recall, the government would put in something in the order of $10 million to a reasonable enterprise, at least a reasonable startup idea. And that kind of money just isn't available in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So uh, actually, many professors are coming back to China. I can give you a little bit of idea why young people are beginning to come to China. Right now, there is a 1,000 talent program. Uh, you probably all heard about it. And uh, in fact, I, I know, Steve, you have to deal with some of the cases. Uh, the, actually, there is a um, similar program with, even with the same name called the Young 1,000 Talent Program. 
that's explicitly targeting young people and people who graduated from you know the graduate from PhD program within several years. And uh, uh, just to give you an idea how attractive this has become, if you get a one of these positions in a top university, let's say, uh, you know, Tsinghua or Beijing University, uh, especially if you can get one of these positions in Shenzhen, for instance, okay, uh, the starting salary is typically between 400,000 to 600,000 renminbi uh, a year. If you divide this by six point whatever, the, around seven, let's say you divide by seven, which is the exchange rate, you already get a pretty decent salary comparable to what you get in the US. Okay? But on top of that, they also uh, give you housing allowance, and in the case of Shenzhen, the government also has certain programs which give you additional income. Uh, for instance, in the, uh, one of the programs give you half a million yuan tax-free. So if you get one of these positions in Shenzhen and in, in other places as well, you are essentially making one million yuan per year as an assistant professor. It's pretty good. So, so I think, Steve, you're seeing a, a choice we've had before between dollars and alleged kind of civil liberties or whatever. Americans may have some gripes about whether it, they live in a police state in China or how much surveillance there is, but people are, are going to willing to sacrifice that if they think they're going to make a good salary with big economic upside. Well, yeah, I think in general, they don't regard their own government as sinister. And so the fact that the government has more powers there than we the government here has, it doesn't frighten them so much. I wanted to come back to these thousand talent programs uh, because it's a huge thing that's in the news these days. Uh, and these pro these programs have been around for a long time. I, it seems like more than 20 years. Um, and so just 10 years ago, when the relationship between the U.S. and China was not so fraught, universities here did not have a problem with a faculty member here uh, having sometimes some kind of joint appointment or dual appointment where they had access to laboratory space in China and students there and could do some of their research in China, and but still were full-time professors in the U.S., and it wasn't really an issue. But now, because of the tensions rising between China, this has become a huge issue where, um, if you watch the news, for example, this professor of chemistry at Harvard, Lieber, has, has been, you know, was in federal prison for not declaring his, uh, bene the, you know, the benefits he was receiving through one of the Thousand Talents programs in China. I think it what was it at Wuhan University? I forgot which university it was. Uh, it's, uh, in one of, yeah, it's in Wuhan University. I yeah. don't actually think he's in the 1000 uh, talent program. He might be in some other program. There is uh, like a Yangtze River program for uh, professors in the foreign university to be appointed for the summer. For right. So, so we went from a period where, as a, you know, I, as a vice president for research 10 years ago, you would have strategized, in fact, I had conversations like this with other VPRs just five years ago, where you strategized to say, oh, uh, you know, if, if we can form some strong relationships with some Chinese universities and, you know, help the researchers at our university by getting them access to these resources that are available in China, it would be a win-win for everybody. And, and we yeah. actually, just five years ago, were strategizing about how to do these things, whereas now uh, the 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 um, the zeitgeist has changed so much that you just want to not have these things go on. It's and a hot potato now. You just want to throw it away. Yes. Yeah, so it's everything has changed very drastically in five years. Now, if you just read the media accounts of what these programs are all about, i.e., that you know they're portrayed as basically being intellectual property theft uh, plans by the government of China. That that certainly wasn't how they were perceived five years ago. And back, back to Corey's point, I, I do think that if you see you yourself have traveled to this region that we're talking about and seen it yourself, but if your only exposure to China was, and I, I hate to say this, but reading the New York Times, I think you would be very accepting of the idea that it's a terrible dystopia where, you know, you'd be crazy to want to move there. 
So, so yes, anyway, but the, the, the Thousand Talents program has become a really uh, difficult hot potato for universities now. Yeah, exactly. I, I think it's very unfortunate. I mean, a lot of these exchange programs are really legitimate, but there is such a you know, xenophobia around in the U.S. now. Um, I, I, I really feel that this, the kind of aggressive uh, pursue or you know, prosecution of the faculty who have any kind of uh, research exchange collaboration with China is going to backfire. Uh, really, is going to backfire. We are already, I mean, from from your point of view, uh, attracting talent from China is already getting more difficult. I see, I can see from my end that many of the faculty are uh, of Chinese origin are calling us, uh, sending us emails saying, well, do you have a position there open for us? And the kind of aggressive recruitment by Tsinghua and Beida uh, have also yielded some pretty high profile recruits uh, right. from the US. Can I drill down on this a little bit more? So, so at the level of, th there's a saying that I often encounter in China, maybe not so much these days, but I did certainly 10 years ago, that hardware is easy and software is hard. And what was meant by that is it's very easy to build a building. They've mastered that. It's very easy to build a state-of-the-art laboratory. They've mastered that. It's even easy to have money available for researchers. But what's harder to replicate is that sort of uh, spirit of discovery, of being a maverick innovator, of having creative new ideas. And for a long time in China, they felt that that was the main thing that they still lacked. And so if I talk to a cynical academic in the U.S., maybe somebody with fairly broad exposure to greater China, they might say something like, yeah, if you go there, you can get an army of grad students, you can get a modern lab. But when you go there, the kind of collegial dialogue and uh, idea exchange and just the some kind of cultural sensibility of how really advanced science is done here in the West is still somewhat missing there. Do you think that's still true? Or do you think that problem has largely been fixed now? Uh, it's not completely fixed. In fact, I, I think it's to some extent still true. Uh, the research landscape in China is driven primarily by KPI. Okay? And KPI is very different from the KPI we have seen in the US. For instance, you are not even going to consider counting a paper that is not in SCI journal voices, okay? So uh, the universities simply don't count it in the merit review. And if you get papers published in some very high profile journals like Nature, Science, uh, you actually get award, okay? So a lot of these awards carry a lot, uh, does, a lot of these awards don't have an expiration date. So you can be one of the, what we call jieqing, that means outstanding young uh, scientists award, okay? And that has an age limit. However, once you get that, you pretty much have that title for your life. And a lot of promotion, you know, uh, salary increase, and benefits getting grants all depend on these titles. So that's why the KPIs are essentially focusing on top-notch journals and getting publications into these journals. And once you have a few of those, you are positioning yourself for awards and eventually becoming an academician in China, which also come with a lot of benefits. Right. So yeah, you know, let me contrast uh, the incentive structure or the metrics used to measure uh, success in, say, China and even South Korea versus, say, Japan. So Japan industrialized earlier and caught up with the West scientifically much earlier. And they are much more willing, in my view, to go their own way, whereas South Korea and China have adopted these very metric-driven performance indicators, which basically just assume that nature and science know what they're doing. And, uh, you know, some Japanese journal 
doesn't necessarily know what it's doing. Um, they just look at the impact factor or they look at some other, you know, very numerical indicator of whether it's, uh, you know, good journal or bad journal. Um, whereas in Japan, they have their own sort of research culture. They can have idiosyncratic people that are working on their own thing for a while. And so it seems like a more mature, self-assured research culture than what, at least in previous years, we had in South Korea and China. But do you think that, do you see any indications that you're going to break out of that uh, systems? I have absolutely no doubt that in, let's say, 10, 15 years, this culture will also change. I think right now, China, if you look at the scientific community in general, there is still a lack of self-confidence in evaluating your own achievements. Okay? So I think you have made a very good point. I mean, that's right on the money about Japan. I think Japan, if you look at the, the scientific community in Japan, they have confidence. And that's why they can go their own ways. But China is also beginning to change. I, I think it's just a matter of time. People are getting more and more confident about what they're what they can bring to the table, to the innovation table. I think any scientist like yourself that has spent significant time in the U.S. or European system and then goes back, they have confidence because they've seen all the systems of the world and they understand what's good and what's bad. The question is whether the local people who have never been outside of China will accept you know, this more confident uh, view of what is quality, what is not quality, and how long that will take to take hold in China. That, that's actually uh, also true. Uh, I would even say that it's not really the local scientists who are the you know who are uh, driving this KPI uh, system. I think it's more of more often it's the uh, administrators and uh, government officials. Yes. Remember, all the Chinese universities are public university. Well, I mean there are uh, private universities, but very few. Okay, most. Almost all the good universities, if you look at from Tsinghua to Ena to USPC, are all public universities. And uh, they are subject to the rules and regulations of the Chinese government, including Ministry of Education. And uh, many universities receive government funding from you know, the central level to the provincial level. So uh, the, the, everybody has to show what they have done with their investment. And the easiest thing to do is the, uh, are those KPIs. Yes. Yeah, so it's really top down from the bureaucrats, actually, maybe that. Uh... I, I sort of sense the gist that we're kind of criticizing the system. But I think for any, any country that's attempting to bring itself up to a, a kind of top level international standard, this is probably the best approach. I have friends who are, you know, work, live and work in Southern Europe and they're just appalled by what gets through as far as uh, qualifications for top-notch jobs. They would love to have something like this, where you simply assess someone on something that's remotely resembling objective criteria, rather than simply who you know. Yeah, so I it, think it's entirely reasonable that this approach. I, I think it's a function of stage of development. So, so it, as you as you try to ascend, having some very metric-driven but fair mechanism is probably your best choice. And, and South Korea and China have sort of entered into that kind of system. The question is, when are they going to be able to bust out of it and basically have a very mature you know, uh, you know, system in which subtle judgments of value can be made because there's a high trust environment and a high confidence in the quality level of the, the, the uh, professoriate and the scientists. And, and so the, that last transition... The, the question is, when is that going to happen in China? That, that's really, I think, what we're focused on. I just want to emphasize that there's a whole set of countries, right, that are in far worse situations from the point of view academics inside of it, where they just feel that even if they do do quality work, they simply cannot advance yeah, because I, of this essentially a kind of nepotism that uh, infects the entire system. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you. If, you. if you want to look at the limiting case of academic cynicism, you should talk to Italian uh, scientists and academics, because they they have very little confidence in their own system, and there's all kinds of corruption. And nevertheless, they're an extremely talented and old uh, civilization, right? So, um, so yes, but I think because we're talking to uh, Wang Yang, I think my main interest is when is that last step in maturation likely to happen in China, and then I think that will free up quite a lot of energy and talent. I mean, there's just probably. I think it's fair to say that as a, if you look at nations just by the, the size 
of China and the, the level of the human capital, th- there's no more, there's no greater potential for scientific and technological advancement than what they have there. It's just a question yeah. of when they're going to get there. Yeah, I, I actually, Corey, uh, let me, uh, uh, I, I actually agree with you. I, I, what I say wasn't really a criticism of the system in China. In fact, I think it's a necessary stage of the development. Uh, for a long time, China had a hierarchical system. You know, you don't have to be super active, but as long as you have seniority, you have the respect of the community, you're automatically uh, being put in position of, uh, power, let's say. Okay, so you dictate uh, how resources will be distributed and, uh, uh, you know, how peak jobs will be distributed. And uh, this KPI-driven system is actually to counter such a hierarchical system. Uh, so it played an extremely positive role for the scientific uh, community, the development scientific community in China. So I would say even today is still playing a relatively positive role. On the other hand, there is a limit to this kind of, you know, how much this kind of system can lead to. And I think that's when 10 years from now, we'll see a much more confident Chinese scientific community with its own ways of evaluation. Sorry to interrupt, but Yang, and that hierarchical system actually exists today in Japan uh, and uh, in France. You know, if you're a young scientist coming up in Japan, you spend a lot of time in another scientist's lab. In fact, you're in another scientist's lab long past the point at which you'd have your own lab in the U.S. And so there is still this hierarchical structure that dictates where resources are allocated. So I think the U.S. is really a, a kind of maybe it's in some sense an ideal in this case. I think the U.S. is not an ideal in many respects. But I think the scientific community is close to being an ideal as far as the fact that if you're a talented young person who develops um, a new program, you're cut loose pretty easily and early on to pursue your own research. I I agree with you that among all the different large scientific and technological infrastructures or systems that we have in the world, the U.S. is probably the best, although obviously there are many problems that you you and I are always talking about. Um, One of the big factors in the U.S., which often doesn't exist in these other countries, is that we have intense competition between our universities. Like we compete head to head with the University of Michigan, which is just down the road. And then collectively we compete against all the other Big Ten universities. And then we got to compete against Georgia Tech and Harvard. And so uh, it allows for new ideas to take hold. And, you know, we will bid for talent. We will, you know, we won't listen to some, we're not driven by some KPI. If we see some scientist that we think is awesome, we'll try to recruit that guy away from UCLA, right? So mm-hmm. um, that's an advantage of the U.S. system. So even though many of these universities I've mentioned are state universities, they're not part of any monolithic system like the Department, uh, the Ministry of Education, right? They're they're actually, you know, maybe beholden to a state system of higher education or maybe somewhat quasi-independent the way that we and University of Michigan are. But anyway, we have lots and lots of competition in the U.S. for science scientific talent. And I think that's the main reason we're good. But but the, the competition is heating up in China as well. I mean, actually, if you look at the Chinese uh, university landscape, at higher education landscape, it, it's behaving today more and more like the U.S. system. You have a lot of competition. The resources are not uniform. Tsinghua and Beida have far more resources than many of the, say, second tier universities. Okay. So, if you look at the, the budget allocation to Tsinghua, it's actually a lot more than MIT, for instance. Sure. Okay. Uh, the, uh, but other universities are stepping up their effort as well because they know it's a positive uh, cycle. You have, you have to invest in getting top-notch scientists into your university in order to build up your portfolio and to get more funding from the government so that everybody is playing this game. Yes. One of the things Corey and I talked about with an earlier guest on a different podcast was the different levels of sort of techno-optimism, China vis-a-vis the United States vis-a-vis Europe. And a part of that is actually university optimism. So optimism in investments in research, basic research in science and technology. And, you know, if you look at any big budget, whether it's the budget of the state of Michigan or the budget of the United States or the budget of the province of Hubei, 
Um, yeah. Education is a higher ed or higher ed research is a tiny little thing. So if the if the governor of that province just says, "Hey, we're I believe in this. We're going to invest in it," they could double the budget overnight and doesn't affect anything else. Like road building is so much more expensive than hiring quantum computing researchers. So just because China has more faith and optimism in technology and in education, I just see them, you know, they would have to screw things up a lot not to really close the gap with the United States over time. That's how I see Mm -hmm. it. Yeah, absolutely. With the amount of investment the country is putting in as you say, it's just a matter of time. And it's the, the amount of time we're talking about maybe, maybe you know, less than 10 years. Yeah. I, I find it, it's amazing how much emphasis right now in the U.S. press is being, and, and the, this per current government, they're placing on the idea that the Chinese are stealing intellectual property from the United States. But it really ain't like that. There's just so much talent uh, I mean, the, the stealing is, in a sense, the fact that people came from China and got educated here, and now they're able to produce their own innovations. That's the main source of catch-up. There may be some point, you know, situations where they did steal nuclear secrets or stealth technology or this or that, but most of the catch-up has not been due to theft. It's been actually just due to talent accumulation and capability exactly, accumulation. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Like, you know, let me just, uh, for instance... Today we're on Zoom, right? I mean, when I look at the Zoom, the, the founder of the Zoom used to work for WebEx and he just formed his own company. I mean, you know, you can say maybe, you know, if if a, if someone in China does Zoom, it will be surely, a, uh, he will be accused of uh, stealing the idea or technology. But this is, you know, essentially due to talent. As you said, there's so much talent going back to China. And there are also, so many talent, I mean, so much talent homegrown in China today. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually quite impressed by the young people I met in China. Just, just to take that example of Zoom, you know, people here are shocked to learn that basically all the capabilities you can think of uh, that are in Skype and Zoom and Facebook and everything else, it's its all in WeChat. So you can actually do all of these things. I could have a video conference with you right now in WeChat. And so the exactly. Ch- Chinese actually have access to actually much better internet technology than what Americans are used to. Um, and mm-hmm. people just can't believe it here. So, oh, we have to use 10 different apps to basically accomplish what I, I could do if I were in China just using WeChat. So everybody's on WeChat today. In fact, you cannot do anything without WeChat. Yeah. I mean, even you order <laughs> food on WeChat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me switch gears. There are two other topics I want to get to. And actually, we'd love to have you as a regular person because you, you can be our eyes in on the other side of the Pacific, right? Yeah, and, sure. Absolutely. Um, I'd love to. Yeah. But, but two things I want to get to today are Hong Kong protests and the political situation in Hong Kong. Spend a little bit of time on that. And then the other big one is coronavirus. And mm-hmm. so uh, let's take Hong Kong protests first and spend a little bit of time on that. So Everybody sees these protests happening in Hong Kong. It's not unexpected that there would be some resistance to the eventual full absorption of Hong Kong into greater China. Now, you yourself are a mainlander. You you didn't grow up in Hong Kong, but you work in Hong Kong. So I suspect you have a very special view of what these uh, protests mean, perhaps who is behind these protests Mm -hmm. that are happening in Hong Kong. So say... Say what you think, but I understand you can get in trouble in Hong Kong for having the wrong opinion uh, about uh, the facts on the ground. So, you know, obviously don't say anything that's going to get yourself in trouble. So let me give you a pointed question. So who's behind these protests? I I actually, uh, you know, there are all kinds of theories about who is behind. You you see, you know, George Soros, you, you hear the CIA, the National Endowment for Democracy, you hear... Taiwan, you hear about certain tycoons in, uh, in Hong Kong. And the, the, the one I actually, the, the conspiracy theory I like most is that uh, the, uh, it's the um, mainland tycoons who, were, who lost favor under Xi Jinping like are Guo. supporting this protest uh, in an aim to overthrow the Xi government. Um, you know, all these are, you know, theories I actually don't know. Um, I, really, I, 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 I do not know. I, I'm pretty sure there are foreign elements 
among the supporters and uh, among those who you know provided support in both in material and in organization. Why do we think anyone's behind the protests aside from the protesters? Why go to the conspiracy theory in the first place? So I think no one doubts that there is a segment of Hong Kong society that is sufficiently unhappy that they're willing to go out and protest in the streets. So no one's saying it isn't a, to some extent, popular movement. Now, the, the degree of how po- you know exactly how popular it is depends on exactly what positions you're talking about. Like the mainstream in Hong Kong maybe doesn't support the more violent or, or aggressive parts of the protest movement. The question is whether when you have a the, the potential for a popular movement, which would destabilize the existing government, do you sometimes also get foreign involvement uh, in which they're actually trying to foment color revolution uh, in, 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 in a society that, in a, a nation that they view as a competitor? Okay, and, so I would rephrase the question. Instead of asking who's behind it, you might say, which external powers may be supporting? Yes, that uh, who's behind it is a leading is a kind of you know I'm trying to it's provocative. It, yeah, it's a provocative way of phrasing the question. But but uh, let me uh, uh, Corey, let me uh, say the following. Okay, so if you look at uh, the protest, the street protest itself, and the violence, uh, you know, with coming with the protest movement you see a lot of material support. And these material support cannot be from the protesters. What kind of material support? They're, they're using like- Oh, there are lots of uh, uh, material support. I mean, all these you know helmets, all these umbrellas, all these, uh, oh. basically all the material and the, including food and the, including cash being paid out to people. In fact, my, my, my helper, my Filipino helper was asked to join the, 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 uh, the procession, you know, if, uh, and she will get like $400 or something to, to join. And uh, she's not alone. Some of them were offered a lot more. I'm skeptical a little bit. Yeah, I have so, to say, I don't think umbrellas are that expensive. And I'm not sure. I haven't seen a huge number of helmets. But anyway, look, I'm, look I think protests are, first of all, they're heterogeneous, always. Movements have people who are have varying inclinations towards using violence. But I'd like to see more evidence that someone's actually paying people to come out. Because that's a consistent argument uh, against many protest movements, some people fundamentally, it's called astroturfing here in the U.S. You essentially, you essentially pay people to so, protest. So, so in the early 2000s, I ran a startup which developed encryption technology, and one of our investors was the CIA Venture Fund. And we worked with the National Endowment of Democracy, the CIA, Radio Free Asia, those are all U.S. government organizations, in order to get information through the Chinese firewall. So for you to tell me that governments don't do stuff like this no, no, is no, just no. crazy. I did not. Now, no, see, no, see, let me finish. 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 Okay. I didn't, personally didn't say that. Okay, let me finish. Okay, maybe I mischaracterized what you said. I'll, I'll take it back. But I, through those associations, it's very clear to me that the U.S. is active in these situations, and those guys regard it as their job, their spooks, to actually give a little nudge to the opposition in countries that they want to destabilize or that they regard as their competitors. And it's just, you know, they would just tell you over coffee, this is what they do. Sure. This, so, this is, look, it's a standing argument you've heard in every protest movement across the world. I, I'm not Perhaps. talking about, I'm talking about actual inside knowledge of how it's done. No, no. You, you said you said in your case, you you had a startup that was funded by this. Look, for all X, okay, X, a country of the protest movement People have said the CIA is behind X. Right. For I'm not. I'm not. I'm not endorsing years. all conspiracy theories. The question is, uh, the question is, does the U.S. sometimes intervene in these covert ways in popular movements in other countries? And so you could look at Ukraine. You could look at what's happening in Hong Kong. And I would be very. I would be very surprised. In fact, I would. You know, if if I were at Langley and I said, "You guys aren't involved in this. Why are you not involved in this? It's a big opportunity for you guys." So to say that they're not doing it seems very crazy to me. Well, I didn't Whether question. they're the dominant effect is another question, right? So, like so, maybe without their aid, everything would have happened exactly the same way or almost exactly the same way. Like, is it a 1% effect or is it a 10% effect? So the number of questions, one question is, where's the burden of proof? Is the default assumption that uh, a significant proportion, say a quarter of the uh, support for 
uh, a protest movement is coming from external sources, part of the CIA. It's unclear to me. Like, it, look, the general assumption among people across the world, as I said, for a long time, is the default assumption is protest movement in country X, not particularly in good relations with the U.S., is funded by the CIA. That's been kind of the, a kind of blanket conspiracy theory. Now, its question is, you know, is that a reasonable assumption, or do you want to actually do you actually require evidence in a particular case that it's occurring, or do you simply assume, as a matter of fact, that it is occurring at a significant amount? Now, what's a significant amount? Uh, I agree with you. The U- U.S. may very well be involved, but honestly, don't know whether you're going to assume the well, large percent I, of the resources are coming from the right. CIA. Right. I think it's unquestionable that, especially in the case of a of a place as strategic as Hong Kong and China vis-a-vis the U.S., that the CIA and U.S. intelligence services wouldn't be involved. Now, whether they are a 1% effect, like maybe they're very, very ineffectual. They're talking to all the wrong protesters. They spent the money on the wrong stuff. They're, you know, Maybe they're totally ineffectual and everything would have proceeded exactly how it proceeded w- regardless of U.S. activity. Or maybe they're quite important in helping to organize these guys, buying the, I forgot what color the umbrellas were, but you know, overnight, millions of umbrellas of the same color appeared on the streets. Uh, oh, sure. I'm sure that they just ordered them from eBay or something or, or, uh, or uh, Taobao. But, 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 or maybe they actually just helped. It doesn't cost that much for the Intel services. You just make an order and say, hey, guys, here, have these umbrellas, right? So I mean, who knows, right? Yeah. Who knows? Right. So the, que- the, the question I'm saying is, is it a 1% effect or 0.1% effect or is it a 10% effect? That's, that's the question, okay. right? So I, I have no now, idea. I'm asking Yang Wang because he has more access to Chinese language media. I'm sure he's following this quite carefully. He lives there. He talked to his Filipino nanny about it. So the question is, what's his view? Because he has access to much more information than you and I have about the situation on the ground in Hong Kong. Well, it's not clear he's more access to information about what the CIA is no, he, funding. No, he clearly has more access to general information about what's happening there. That's right. That's right. But but on this particular question, right, the question is, right. living yes. in China, do you have more information about whether the CIA is funding a particular... Yeah, no, I, I don't have more information on that one. Yeah. Uh, but Corey, I, I can tell you that there is very little doubt uh, that there are external parties that fund this movement. Uh, whether with without this uh, external fund, the movement will keep going. That's a different. Uh, that's really a different question. In fact, I personally believe most people actually took to the street voluntarily because they really feel strongly about the cause of the uh, the movement. It doesn't mean I agree with the cause of the movement, but I, I do believe that most of them right. took to the street upon themselves. That's what my Hong Kong friends here have been telling me. Their view is that they see this slow-moving takeover, uh, uh, and they're, they understand that, look, people there who haven't gotten out are going to fight tooth and nail to at least try to prevent it for as long as possible. And they themselves are quite happy not to be under the system, right? So granted, they're a little like expats. Expats are like converts. They scream the loudest. And so they themselves uh, are probably not representative people. But their view is that they see this as a pretty legitimate response to reductions in civil liberties. I don't think anybody denies that it's natural for the Hong Kong people to react to this to some extent. And no one doubts that there is a a popular basis of some sort for all of this. The question is just what's the level of uh, external uh, activity here and how inconsequential is it? Let's step back and actually, I want to take the role of our audience ombudsperson. Let's remind people of why these protests started. Um, and it was originally uh, a law of extradition. There was a case in which Hong Kong resident was in Taiwan. He killed his f- girlfriend. And then he... Uh, uh, then he uh, came back to Hong Kong, and he could not be extradited to Taiwan because there was no treaty. And then a law was put in place to allow extradition to the, the Taiwan. Ex- the extradition treaty was not initiated by the mainland government. It was initiated by That's the right. Hong Kong That's government. Right. And f- because of this case involving Taiwan, it had nothing to do when it was initiated with extradition to China. But then, of course, it has some impl- legal laws have other implications, right? So the question is, what did the Chinese government see? Hey, this is an opportunity for us to get in here. You're expecting skepticism. Why not? Right? They see they're I, smart. They I, I think it was an own goal by the Hong Kong government to to push this, and uh, I don't think it was that strategic for the main. The mainlanders have been willing to actually literally kidnap people from Hong Kong. When well, they, I think, when I think they so. I think their <laughs> views. This is a clean. This is a cleaner way of doing it. Right? They see. Look, instead of having to kidnap people, for which we got all this bad press, yes. let's just have an extradition treaty, and we can bring these 
booksellers or yes. whoever else we want to get in prison. Um, so maybe they're opportunistic. Anyway, Yang, what's your view on, can you give us your sense of what it was like my, when we started? My, yes. Um, uh, so the extradition treaty uh, was, as you pointed out, was essentially triggered by this particular murder case uh, in Taiwan and uh, the the man fled to Hong Kong and there was no way to extradite him to Taiwan. So there was a, a push actually to get an extradition treaty with Taiwan. And at the same time, they you know, didn't have extradition treaty with Macau, with uh, mainland China. So they wanted to do all these things in one go. Okay. And that was to me a big political miscalculation. And that triggered this huge, uh, first it was triggered a big debate about why we should do this with mainland China. And, but when you think about it, Hong Kong is part of China. Uh, it was actually, in my view, quite natural to have such a treaty if you are going to do this you know, at all. But the problem is there was a deep distrust in the society of the mainland government Okay. Now, Corey, going back to your point, whether the Chinese government actually pushed the Hong Kong government to do this, okay? So I do not have any uh, sort of, you know, inside information. I did talk to someone who was actually pretty high rank in the Chinese government, and he told me in no uncertain term that this was completely a Hong Kong uh, government decision. In fact, he was, he, he even told me the central government was actually pretty upset at Hong Kong for sort of pushing really hard on this and the fail to address the anger in a timely manner. Okay. Now, so that was what I was able to get. Now, of course, I, I, I don't think I know the full detail and I don't think any of us have access to the inside information. I can only judge from what I hear and my gut feeling. My gut feeling is the central government did not push for it. However, the current chief executive was so confident in what he was able to achieve. He, during his brief tenure as the chief executive, he managed to push uh, through several controversial uh, legislations or appropriations, for instance, for, you know, uh, basically many initiatives that were meeting some resistance from the Democrats, but he was able to push them through. And by and large, I actually like what she was doing. Uh, many of these were just, you know, have no political agenda, for instance, the, the, um, the, the, uh, the high-speed train, and she helped finally pushing it through, and uh, the uh, the increased funding for higher education, doubling the RGC, the Research Grant Council. Uh, all these things have really no or building hostel for you know students and everything. All these uh, had difficulty passing through the the ledge code, and uh, you know she, under her leadership they were able to push through some of these measures, but she became really, in my view, a bit too cocky, and she thought she could push through this despite the opposition. And I think she really underestimated the opposition, so she managed to you know, push strongly for this, and it really backfired. In the end, they actually modified the expedition, uh, uh, basically the expedition bill so that only violent criminals with uh, who will be sentenced to seven years or more in prison can be extradited. But you know that was already after the discussion of uh, having extradition treaty, and that already created a lot of anxiety. So even with this uh, revision, uh, people just simply you know, didn't take it, and they took took it to the street. It was a huge number of people uh, in the beginning to the street. So that was a total political miscalculation, and eventually it just went completely out of control. I, I think that 
the trigger event is clearly, for the, all these protests, is clearly what you described. But there's a sort of long-term problem in Hong Kong that the property is controlled by a relatively, you know, real estate is controlled by a relatively small number of super oligarchs. And the provision of public housing uh, has really been quite slow and underdeveloped. And so what you have is very strong disenchantment of younger people and working class people because they know they'll never be able to buy an apartment in Hong Kong. And so that that whole dynamic really has very little to do with the mainland government. It, it is somewhat exacerbated by rich mainlanders buying real estate in Hong Kong and driving up the prices. But this idea that they didn't really, it's basically wealth inequality um, gone crazy in Hong Kong. And that's driving a lot of the protests, I think, not, not, necess- not just this uh, particular extradition treaty. I, uh, uh, Steve, actually, uh, this was the point I was trying to make uh, to many of my American friends earlier. But later, I, I begin, I'm beginning to have some second thought about it because throughout this movement, no one ever mentioned about these inequalities, which to my big surprise, actually was never on the menu for the, you know, for the, the grievances that were addressed, uh, trying to, to, uh, to address uh, or to demand. Uh, it was uh, m- mostly about, you know, of, of course, original was about the extradition, then was mainly about the police brutality, and uh, the distrust of the central government, and to some way, the distrust of any mainland yes. Chinese. Yes, but I, uh, I, I, agree, I agree with that. And in terms of official demands of protest organizers, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it, there's also, if you look at sort of sociology on the ground, when reporters did interview young people and say, why are you out there? This is, isn't this going to destroy your future, you know, if you're caught you know, via face recognition as one of the guys who destroyed property during the riot. You know, why are you out here doing this? Sometimes the kids would say, I have no future in Hong Kong. I will never be able to buy uh, an apartment, right? And so I think that at a base level played a role in some people, the people, so you might ask like the violent extremists are always a tiny fraction of any movement. And the question is, well, what made them despair to the degree that they were willing to take these violent actions is probably people often with less to lose, and they just don't feel they have a future in Hong Kong because, you know, uh, Hong Kong is for rich people, basically. Um, and, and so I think that the dynamic plays there. I am a little surprised that the movement didn't ask for things like more public housing, better public housing, public housing, which is more central to the main part of Hong Kong. I'm a little surprised that that hasn't emerged yet, but, you know, that part I don't really understand. So so let's review the five demands before we go on too much. Let's just remind our listeners of the demands of the protesters. Uh, They want the extradition bill uh, withdrawn fully. They want a commission to investigate police brutality. Uh, Independent commission. Independent commission, yeah. Yeah. They want uh, the protesters, uh, they want a retraction of the classification of the protesters as rioters. So it's very narrow. They want amnesty for arrested protesters, and they want... um, Dual universal suffrage, meaning both the legislative council and chief executive should be uh, popularly elected. It's that last one that has long-term implications. Yeah. The other ones are all very term- narrow, right? But the, the last one might help fix this issue of inequality in Hong Kong, right? So, I mean, it's not clear how good democracy is at stopping uh, inequality, as you see in the United States. But I see your point. It's a potential yep. Uh, yep. way through the door. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. Let's give a little context. Yang, do you have at your fingertips an estimate for how expensive... Hong Kong real estate is, because I think it would shock many people to know how much a basic one-bedroom apartment would cost. So let's say if uh, usually it's measured by square feet or square meter, okay? So in mainland, it's square meter. So let's just use square meter. So it's 10 square feet. Uh, 10.4 or something, okay? Yes. Yeah, 10 square feet, yeah. So uh, in Beijing, the list price for properties in Beijing is about uh, maybe on average uh, 80,000 yuan per square meter. So you are talking about uh, over maybe 12,000 US dollars per square meter. Okay, that's very expensive in Beijing. In fact, the higher, uh, uh, the more expensive areas in Beijing could go 
for more than 100,000 yuan and renminbi per square meter. And Hong Kong, just think about it, Hong Kong is more expensive than the most expensive uh, places in, uh, in China. I, the way I often think about this, and Corey, you should chime in because I know that you're an actual New York City landlord. Basically, the metric, if you want to do it in square feet for the most expensive places, it's of order, rough justice, $1,000 a square foot, right? And that's in true. The US. Well, that, in New York? Yeah, like New York City, Manhattan. I mean, if you want an Upper East Side apartment, I think it's in excess maybe of $1,000 a square foot. Yeah, that's about right. And, and similar in Hong Kong. And that would apply- uh, Hong Kong is more expensive. Okay, even more, but, but, not, or, but not factor two. I mean, like rough justice, it's, it could be 50% more expensive, but not two times, right? Not, it's not 2,000. Mm, I would say probably more than 50%. Okay, but it's not, it's not $20,000 per square meter yet. Twenty thousand. Uh, uh, actually, in the Hong Kong island, I would say that's more or less the the price. Okay, that's the island. But but so if you're a working class person and you want to buy an apartment and you're willing to live a little, you know, a couple metro stops away from Hong Kong Island, thousand dollars a square foot or ten thousand per square meter is maybe what. Uh, yeah, I would say uh, the more than ten. Yeah. 000. So you're talking about a guy who maybe works at a restaurant. <laughs> or does some kind of blue collar stuff, being asked to pay what someone pays on the Upper East Side for, for an apartment. So how can they have any future? How can they, how can they have family formation? How can they do anything, right? So um, that's the problem. And a lot of them want to immigrate to Taiwan, for example, because it's much more reasonable, the cost of living. So, um, so that's, I think, the fundamental problem. And that, that's kind of there because the oligarchs have not you know they want to preserve these very high property prices because it's there in in their, in their interest because they own most of it. Yeah, but but also it's uh, it's more than the oligarchs. Actually, even the middle class, uh, many of the middle class in Hong Kong actually do own property. Yes. from you know uh, they inherited or they bought it a while ago. For for example, many people bought houses during the SARS uh, crisis and. At the time, the the price was uh, really really low. Okay, so uh, the the Hong Kong everybody was afraid the market would just completely collapse. So the 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 the, the housing was falling to the rock bottom, and the many just you know were brave enough to buy a few uh, flats, and now you know they own the house. And these are the people who don't want to see the price drop. They want to see this price being maintained. On the other hand, you have the young people who really cannot afford it. Not just young people, but several, even middle class people, even people who have a really good job. You know, I'm talking about people who work in the financial industry in Hong Kong, and they cannot really afford a very nice apartment at all. Well, so one, they're one, renting. One, yeah. one of the things... Peter Thiel said famously a few years ago about California, about the Bay Area, was that if you're a venture investor, most of your dollars, if you track where they're going, they're going into the salaries of startup employees and then to pay for rent in the Bay Area. And similarly, why would you want to do a tech startup in Hong Kong if you know, you're going to have to compensate your engineers so much that they, so that they can just live in Hong Kong? You know, why not just go to Shenzhen or some other city and put the startup there? So That's a really good point. In fact, uh, uh, Shenzhen is also very expensive. Okay, it's, it's catching up to Hong Kong. Yes. I mean, not quite, but it's uh, catching up. So, but the Shenzhen government is uh, far more, I would say, far sighted. Yeah. So they plan to, they actually build houses, apartments just for rental. Right. So it's that. To attract talented people. Yeah. It's that last step that Hong Kong has not, right? They've not executed on low cost housing for working class people or maybe even engineers that you want to attract to the city or something. But Hong uh, Kong is also one of the densest uh, cities on the planet, no, but right? See, so this, how much space is no, there? No, this is where you're wrong. So if you go up to the border between Hong Kong and Shenzhen, there's plenty of open space. And so everybody who first goes there says, well, why aren't they building here? And then it turns out, well, the property developers bought all this land oh. and they are not developing it. 
right? Am I, is that fair? So, so, how, so as a fraction of the currently developed real estate in Hong Kong, how much is there in this kind of interstitial space? That's there's not there's developed? plenty. Like a lot of the low cost stuff is built far from the city core, so you have to ride the metro multiple stops to go out there, and that's where the low cost housing is, and it's isolated away from the core. And it, but as you ride the train out there, you see a lot of open space. You're like, oh, I could put another twenty story apartment complex here, and I could put one here. So just square foot acreage is not really the limiting factor as far as I understand. Yeah, actually uh, also uh, Hong Kong has many parks that were uh, preserved, so you could not develop. In fact, some people did the calculation. If you just open up the peripheral of these parks, yes. you could pretty much solve the housing problem in Hong Kong. Yeah, but nobody wants to do it. Right. Maybe Xi Jinping will force them to do it. <laughs> Uh, in fact, the, the the really, I mean, in all honesty, I think Steve, you were right. In fact, China, if you want to address the 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 housing problem or the economic problem, China, the central government, ironically, could be the the only solution to the current Hong Kong yep. crisis. The enlightened Leviathan, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. I, I let me just go back to one point uh, Corey was making about you know, the the freedom being fringed and everything, okay? So, I mean, that was the kind of uh, sentiment I got when I talked to some of my Hong Kong friends who were supportive of the protest movement. And I always ask them, you know, which freedom you feel you have been taken away, it has been taken away. And they could not give a definitive answer because in fact, in my view, not a single item had been taken away. Well, hold it. During hold the it. last two years or so. Hold it, but take the extradition treaty itself. Uh, if you take a look at the requirements and fair trials in China, there are very few protections if you're extradited to China. You've got... Uh, there's no presumption of innocence. Uh, the judge is involved in the investigations, so they're often, they often have their opinion uh, decided before the case comes. You know, you, there's no exclusionary rule. So you could say that those are rights being taken away. If you can be extradited to a country where you have no rights, effectively, that's implicit uh, uh, elimination of a right you have in Hong Kong right now. So maybe they couldn't state it, but that's, as far as I could see, a legitimate grievance. Yeah. I, I think you're right, Corey. But, for example, people tend to ignore that in Japan, uh, also, once you're charged with a crime, your rights are not nearly as great as what you would have in the United States, and their conviction rate is like 99%. So, so you know, people don't think of Japan as a dystopia, even though you also, your rights to a, quote, fair trial are maybe a little different in Japan than they would be in the United States. But you see why someone might be anxious about the thought of being extradited to a place where you sure, absolutely. can't defend yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so my point is, you know, we, we actually, when you look at uh, the freedom, the so-called freedom index, okay? I mean, take whatever, you know, face value of, uh, 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 you know, you may give to to the, the freedom index. Hong Kong has been ranked number one in the world until two years ago, which, uh, 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 which I think the rank was number three. And this year, again, despite all the protests, it's still number three, okay? Now, in my view, the problem of Hong Kong is it has too much freedom, especially too much economic freedom. And the inequality was actually a result of too much freedom, not the lack of freedom. I think, Corey, you may agree with this. In fact, I learned this from you. I mean, you were very fairly critical. Yeah, you know? no, I think it's. I think you're right. It's important, however, I think any libertarian in the U.S. who tends to be, uh, when we think of libertarian, we tend to think of someone's right wing, right? They divide freedoms implicitly into two areas, right? Economic freedom and then uh, kind of civil liber civil liberties, basically. And as far as I know, you're thinking that there's just too much economic freedom. It's sort of too economically libertarian. Uh, but you have to realize that you, these two freedoms can vary inversely, fundamentally. And I think the protesters, Steve was probably getting the idea that protesters probably should be concerned about economic freedom, uh, and they might have brought that up, but they or, fact, or maybe haven't. economic justice. <laughs> yeah, however you want to want to put it. But uh, no, I, I, I agree with you. Can we switch to coronavirus because we're sure. running out of time? Yeah. Sure. So, okay. mm -hmm. so you want to give us your quick take on where it is now and where you project it to be in the next couple months? Um, well, first of all, let me just say it has a huge impact on the society now. Okay, so now we're switching all the courses online. We're 
you know, for the whole semester and the Chinese university are doing the same thing as I previously said. Oh, let's let's be clear. Uh, People are not coming to class anymore. They're taking everything. No, in their- they don't have to. In fact, if the government, uh, so we're going to follow the government schedule. If the government deemed the schools to be safe for primary school students, for instance, high school students, we will allow the student to come in. Right now, even if you want to teach students face to face, you are not allowed to do it. Okay, so in some places in mainland China, you are not even allowed to have a meeting if the meeting has more than five people, for instance. Okay, so uh, so so this is the kind of impact we're talking about. All the factory have stopped, essentially stopped, and all the most of the economic activity have been stopped. So. I, I personally feel uh, we have a little bit of a overreaction in some way, okay? So I, I'm not saying we should not have this kind of really strong measures uh, to prevent the further spread of uh, coronavirus, uh, but some of these measures we, we have implemented are really uh, fairly strict, and I'm just afraid of the impact on the economy, especially in Hong Kong today. I think there's no doubt there'll be some dip uh, in economic activity, significant dip over the next few months. I'm curious whether you think this virus will be sufficiently contained in China, where they're taking very draconian measures. Maybe that's plausible to me. But once it gets out a little bit to some countries that maybe aren't willing to take such draconian measures or not able to, maybe big populous countries like Indonesia, for example, um, yeah. Is there really any way to contain this, or is it basically going to sweep the planet? <laughs> That's my question. I, I don't think it's going to sweep the planet. Um, also, uh, right now, the, the virus, uh, even though it's gathered all these headlines, it not, doesn't seem to be particularly dangerous. It's more like, I mean, it's, it's worse than the flu. Obviously. But less bad than um, SARS, right? I think of the lethality, it's like 1% lethal. And I think SARS was far higher. Right. Well, the fewer people have died yeah, so, so far. So uh, if I could died throw out SARS. parameters and see if you guys agree. So R0, which is the sort of expected number of people infected by one infected individual, is, is on the order of two to three. Of course, that depends on what's being done to isolate people. If you, if you don't have the, the controlling measures yes. in place, yes. And then secondly, the lethality rate might be around 1% and highly concentrated in older people. Exactly. And, and, and maybe highly concentrated in East Asians, too. So we so you think there's a, uh, there a are, or sensitivity? Yeah, there are some claims. There's this thing called the ACE, ACE receptor that uh, the genetics of that are a little bit different in East Asians. And so it, it's possible that for this disease, East Asians are, are more vulnerable uh, to serious uh, consequences. That It's still early days, because I think almost everybody who's been affected so far is actually East Asian, but so we won't know the answer to that for a while, but it's it's possible. I just remember thinking about 20 years ago when SARS hit, there was a, I mean, this had a, a I don't even know exactly the, the lethality rate, but it was significantly higher. And I remember a story about one guy who survived, people trying to figure out how did this guy possibly survive this? And apparently he had just phenomenal, he was phenomenally healthy. This guy ran 14 miles a day. He was some a real outlier, and the thought is this guy's extraordinary health got him through this. That's something that you don't hear about this because it just seems like it's much less lethal. People aren't shocked when people come through this uh, condition. Right. But uh, so coming back to the spread of it, you, Yang Wang, you don't think it's gonna, you don't think it's going to break out and sweep the planet. No, I, I don't actually. Uh, uh, I can look at the data. In fact, I'm, I'm I, I keep a table of. Uh, you know, new cases being diagnosed. Uh, for the new cases outside of Hubei province, actually the data looks quite encouraging. The R0 is less than one overall. Okay, you can see a, uh, a slow decreasing trend. At most, it's linear. Okay, so it's not exp- exponential. That means uh, the measures of uh, quarantine or you know, asking people, discouraging people from going out is working, no question about it. Okay? Uh, the, in, in Hubei, it's fluctuating. Uh, the overall trend still uh, is either linear or slightly upward. 
uh, meaning a very slow growth. So that means the R0 is, you know, on average is probably either one or, you know, 1.05 or something like that. And yeah. do, you, do you think that, so I, my understanding is right now that up till now, the Chinese government has not allowed external WHO uh, scientists in to participate in containment of this epidemic. And so, first of all, there's a question of how much you trust the Chinese government self-reported data. But secondly, in the other countries outside of China, where I think WHO does have some access to what's going on, looking at those numbers, those are also encouraging, it seems to me. It seems like I don't see an uncontrolled outbreak in any of the other countries where it's gotten to. But do you trust the government numbers? I trust the number. Actually, uh, let me say, I, I feel, I mean, I've been telling people that uh, it's my view the figures outside of Hubei are trustworthy. I mean, I don't see any motive for the government to uh, conceal these numbers. Okay? In fact, uh, they have every incentive now to report the, the situation, either maybe even exaggerate the situation a little bit. So I, I, don't, uh, I, I don't really have much issue with the data coming out of Hubei. Okay. On the other hand, I also, for the Hubei data, I think uh, the number of deaths and the number of people who are uh, being released from hospital should be fairly reliable. Okay. However, I think, I suspect there is a significant undercounting of people who, you know, who actually are in infected by the virus, simply because they just don't have enough personnel, enough hospitals. Uh, I mean, the, the hospital are completely overwhelmed. Right. Well, I mean, at any given moment, there are plenty of people who just happen to have flu-like symptoms. And then it, unless you actually run the test, the, you know, uh, to see whether it's actually coronavirus, the new coronavirus, you won't know. You know, so this cruise ship is kind of a natural laboratory for ask, actually estimating the accuracy of your initial diagnoses because it, it seems like the numbers are creeping up and they... Uh, pretty clearly underestimate the number of people infected. It seems like there probably aren't any more infections happening because people are confined to their cabin. But, uh, you know, they, 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 they did not know uh, who was infected initially on the basis of symptoms, and tests have made it pretty clear. But, but I think the latest news from Hong Kong involves some plumbing. Like, they actually now think the, through the plumbing system. It's, it's a hypothesis. Yeah. One woman, I think, on the 10th floor had it, and a guy on the third floor. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so they, uh, they quarantined uh, those who live on the same, uh, in this, com this uh, you know, whole vertical uh, units. Yes. Yeah, same vertical units affected by the pipe. Yeah, but I'm, I'm actually confident. I mean, the coronavirus will not do very well uh, under hot climate, right? When the temperature rises, uh, you know, so it will go away. So at worst, it will stop in June, yes, in my view. Exactly. But I think it will be earlier, actually. Yeah. But I think the worst case scenario some people have is that, yeah, it'll burn itself out by June. But if, if it does get out and spread around the world, you'll just have another sort of slightly more lethal version of the flu that's out and about, uh, in, you know, because we already have lots of versions of flu and pneumonia that are out and about, right? So, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, I think that's the worst case scenario. Yeah. The fatality rate that right now uh, is pegged at about two percent, but I think in the end it would be much lower than that. Yeah, because of the un, you know, the people that are undiagnosed with it, underreported yeah. uh, yeah. confirmed cases. Yeah. I, again, my question is whether we're exaggerating this because it's a new virus and it's caught our attention. When in fact we have the flu percolating in the background, killing substantial numbers of people, but it's something we're familiar with and as a result, less scared about. Right. I, I mean, flu is endemic. It's all. It's basically spread everywhere, but it is on a per capita basis, much less lethal, right? Yes, so, that's right. Yeah. But much more widespread. Yes. and th But this one could end up there. If we're not careful, this one could end up widespread yeah. and 10 times or 100 times more lethal than ordinary flu, right? So Exactly. I, I think a lot of uh, uh, fear uh, can be attributed also to unknowns because we do not know about this virus at all. I mean, maybe the second time around, it will be treated just like a... a worst case of flu. Yes, correct. Okay, yeah. And we'll know a lot more about the epidemiology of who's actually at risk. Because uh, I think, as you point out, 
people at risk uh, tend to be older, um, probably actually not far from our age range. Uh, and uh, it, it could be that it's, uh, you know, really just people who are in that age range at risk and the people in your university uh, who are young and healthy aren't really that much in danger. And if they get a shot, they'll be fine. So, yeah. Young Wang, could you tell me what your travel calendar looked like uh, before coronavirus for the next few months and what it looks like now? <laughs> Have you canceled well, all your travel? Uh, yeah, I actually, I had a lot of trips planned uh, for mainland China, for Beijing, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen. And I had even uh, thought about, uh, I actually, I did, uh, did have a trip scheduled to go to the U.S. In fact, I was planning to go to Michigan State because I already talked to Andrew uh, Chrisley, and I'm still doing it. We'll, okay? we'll see so, you in June when the weather's warm. But exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, we'll get your own, and, your own private uh, hotel. I cancel all my trips. So is it possible, to me, it seems like the use of video conferencing is still mainly constrained by social convention, not by the effectiveness of it. So yeah. um, just hold to it, give you- this, Actually, this is a direct contradiction of your own view, which is that you know, we should, big primates, we have a saying in our office, which is big primates interact best face to face. And we have basically a policy that whenever we can, we don't interact by video conference because it is less effective. People just don't, you and I want to be in the same studio if possible when we do these recordings because it just works out better. Yes. And, but in this case, the cost is relatively low, like for us to get into the same room together. Whereas if you're flying all the way to Silicon Valley to take a meeting, you know, then maybe video conferencing is better. Another social aspect of it that I might mention is that I've been trying to get my friends, my buddies from like high school and college, we, regu- we regularly text or talk to each other on the phone, but I said, we should just set, out a, set aside a time every month where we're just all on video conference for a couple hours and we can just hang out and chat. And it's I, as far as I can tell, it's mainly just social convention that people just aren't into that. But it seems like coronavirus could be a thing that triggers, just sort of pushes people past a certain tipping point where they, for a few months, are going to have to invent video conferencing solutions to a lot of things. And then they'll realize, like, it's kind of 90% is good or 80% is good. And then for a lot of things, they'll they'll start using it more. It, does that seem plausible? This is already happening. I mean, here, um, I just had a Zoom meeting with my friends. Uh, I mean, we don't have a conference. We don't, we don't have any, you know, math to discuss. It's simply just these friends are trapped in Wuhan. Well, <laughs> several of them are trapped in Wuhan and they have nothing to do. So I say, okay, let's have a Zoom conference just to chat. And uh, actually the experience was good. You can have a seminar on, uh, you know, uh, P manifolds or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, about the coronavirus, I, I will also say one thing about the government's, uh, you know, all the responses. Actually, the Chinese government, uh, of course, has been criticized in the um, social media all over China. Actually, people think they're not doing enough, blah, blah, blah. And uh, some people feel there's, uh, they're deliberately trying to clamp down on information and things like that. Um, I, I, I don't know about information side, but I've been telling people that if you want to see the virus get controlled, you really, the, the, the most critical thing to do is to isolate people, to quarantine you know, people who are known to be infected. That's the only way to really effectively stop the spreading of the virus. And on that front, the government has done a few things which I kind of, uh, I, I, I say I applaud. You know, they built several hospitals in record time, like seven days. I mean, we would not be able to think about this in Hong Kong. I mean, how can you build a hospital in seven days? But that's what they have done. They've built, you know, two hospitals uh, in that kind of speed, and they turned into uh, several hotel rooms, uh, hotels into quarantine uh, quarters, and they utilize um, sports halls, sports halls, uh, stadiums for quarantine, you know, of, uh, of uh, infected uh, patients. All these things, I think, have contributed to the slowing down of the spread of the virus. Uh, but I also got the feeling that in Wuhan and the Hubei province in general, that's not even enough. I think it's just too many people get infected. And the, even with this kind of effort, we still see an upward kick 
in number of, uh, of uh, newly infected. So, you know, uh, it's, it's not going to be easy. I mean, it's not going to be, uh, it's, we're not going to see the end as some models predicted like in the beginning of March. But I certainly don't believe some of the model, you know, one of the viral, uh, virologists in Hong Kong claimed that, uh, that that was two weeks ago, Hong Kong will have 140 million people, you know, infected in two weeks. And of course, we are already two weeks, you know, after his prediction. Right now, we have uh, 42 cases. Okay? So I don't believe in these doomsday predictions, but I also don't believe it's going to go away, you know, by the end of the, the month. So we're out of time, uh, but it's been great chatting with you and catching up with you. Yeah, it's great. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Okay.